first scripture reading today is from Genesis, Genesis chapter 24, 1 through, I'm actually going to read 1 through 15. Uh, this is from the New International Version that uh, Pastor Ben has chosen for the reading. Abraham was now old and well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the chief servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heavens and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife from my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I am living, but will go to the country and my own relatives and get a wife from my son Isaac. The servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of the father's household in my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me an oath, saying, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, so that so that you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine, only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand on the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and left, taking with him all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for Aram, not Aram, and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was towards evening, the time the women go to draw the water. Then he prayed, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside the spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to the girl, please let down your jar, that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, of uh, Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. Uh, the Gospel reading today is from the Gospel of John, the second chapter, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples also had, was also invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw out some and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drunk the wine knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guest had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed in Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Well, when I met with Pastor Ben at the hospital on Friday, and it was obvious that he would not be able to give a sermon for Sunday. So I volunteered to stand in for him as best I could and I asked him about the sermon, about the message. And he said, well, it's on marriage. 
that I, that I responded to him rather quickly. I said, marriage? I said, boy, that's really quite a topic to be talking about. And my wife was there, and evidently she took a little uh, offense to it, thought I was a little bit more jovial than I should have been. I tried to convince her that I was thinking deep theological thoughts, but I don't think I convinced her. But, but marriage, as we well know, it can range from comedy to drama to uh, a little bit of theology to who knows what. But I will stick with the script this morning as I promised Pastor Ben, and uh, we'll talk about more of the theology of the marriage today. This story with Abraham, the background of the story is that in verse, in chapter 24, Abraham was in essence on his deathbed. Sarah had passed away, his beloved wife. Abraham had Isaac when he was approximately 100 years old. And you remember the story that uh, Sarah was well past the years of bearing children. God had made his covenant with Abraham actually decades before. And now the fruition of that had come into play with the birth of Isaac. Isaac, however, at this point, he's 40 years old. He's well past the Jewish traditional time of marriage. They usually marry about 30 years or younger. So when Isaac has his servant, ask his servant for a wife for, excuse me, Abraham asked his servant to find a wife for Isaac. He's at a point where he believes that obviously of the covenant and that it's going to be fulfilled, but he is on his deathbed and he wants to do his part to assure that that takes place because the line of Christ is at stake here. The covenant is at stake at this point in history. So he calls his chief servant and he has him swear an oath. And it's interesting lying there about the thigh and putting his hand underneath the thigh. That, by Jewish tradition, meant that it was, I guess, considered a super oath. It was a tradition. It was something that was even more binding than just making a basic oath at that point in Judaism. At that point, I should say, in history. So that's what his servant was doing. His chosen servant agreed to go to Abraham's ancestors, to the uh, to the, the uh, nation of, uh, I think it was Babylonia, but it was the uh, area of Ur, you are called the uh, Ur. And Abraham had journeyed to Canaan, which is now pretty much modern day Israel. And in essence, he's telling the servant not to take a Canaanite wife because the Canaanites at that point in time and point in history, they had um, everything from idol worship to potentially sacrificing of their own children. So he did not want to uh, to taint the bloodline of Christ, uh, taint the blood the line of the covenant. So he told him to go back to the land of Canaan, and his servant agreed to do so and buy an oath. And his servant was also a man of great prayer, and that's really the key here because he prayed. He prayed to God when he got to the land, the land of his ancestors in Ur, which is now. Uh, northern, modern day, northern Syria. He went to the water well and he prayed. And he asked God to show him the way. And if a woman appeared at the well, he would ask her for some water. Not only would she give him water, but she would also water his camels. So that was the sign he was looking for. He was not putting God to the test. He was simply making sure that that would be the right woman. So lo and behold, when he's at the well, and notice it's at the well, it's not a place of leisure, it's not a place of, of study or anything of that nature. It is a place of work, it's a place of industry, drawing water. And who would happen to come up but Rebecca? And Rebecca comes forward, he goes out to meet her, he asked her if she would give him some water. Not only does she give him the water, but she also agrees to water his candle. So what the servant was looking for was someone who was courteous and hospitable by allowing the stranger to be fed or be watered to have nourishment from their, her own water pitcher. And not only that for an industrious person, 
for someone who is willing to work and to take care of the household. But what he got in answer to prayer was much more than that. Besides those, those characteristics and qualities, she was very beautiful, and she was also a woman of prayer and a woman of faith. Because she, Rebecca, just like Abraham, agreed to leave, leave her land, to leave her father, to leave her mother, to journey to a land and meet a husband she had never set eyes on before, and to enter up the promised land of God that she had never heard of before. So she also turned out to be a woman of great faith, and therefore she was included in the life of Christ along with Isaac. And with that, we have the great prayer of the servant, and that leads right into in Jesus' time, the wedding feast at Canaan. And Canaan was approximately four to eight miles away from Nazareth. This particular story is only told in John. It's not told in any of the other Gospels. But God, the John was unique in that about 95% of its content is not found in, in the other Gospels of its amazing stories. And what Jesus was doing when he was at the wedding feast, and we of course have the miracle, and I'm not going to talk about the miracle that much on a theological basis. Uh, books have been written about that, chapters have been written, and we know a lot more about that. But I want to talk about the symbolism of that day. What Christ is doing by being present at the wedding feast, what the Son of God on earth is doing uh, by being present at the wedding feast, at the wedding, He's saying this is worthy of his presence. This is worthy of Jesus' presence. Christ, the Son of God, come down from the heavens, is honoring the sanctity of marriage. Honoring on earth the very thing that was created long ago between Adam and Eve. Honoring the sacred union between the two. He is honoring and setting forth the holiness of marriage by making this his first miracle that he has ever done. The first time that he has ever revealed his glory was at this wedding feast. And it is appropriate that it is honoring the union of marriage. And that says to us how holy that God holds that union. How holy of a thing it is when we are led and from between a man and a woman to make that relationship of love into something more than a religious relationship but into a holy thing, this being marriage. And he also draws a comparison that the marriage itself is a symbol because it's a symbol basically of the union of two people becoming one but it takes on the same characteristics as Christ's union with his church. We are the church of Christ, the body of Christ. The building, we call it as a church, but really it's not the church. It's just a building. The body of Christ, his church, when he said, upon this rock, Peter, I will build this church. He wasn't talking about building. He was talking about people. The body of Christ is us. It's us in the pews. It's us doing the work of Christ. It's us being the hands and feet of Christ. So what he is saying here is, is that the union of the church, us as the body of Christ, that union with Christ, with us being the bride of Christ, is as sacred as that of marriage between a man and a woman and the coming together of the two.